Hello, my name is Dr Claire Ross and I'm a lecturer in German Studies at the University of Reading in the UK and a member of the Scholarly Collective Towards an Equitable German Studies. This is a recording of Growing Up Biracial in Germany, a conversation that I had with Ijoma Mangold, a writer and one of Germany's leading literary critics at the University of Reading on the 4th of March 2022. In the conversation, I talked to Mr. Mangold about his award-winning literary memoir, Das Deutsche Krokodil, which was originally published in 2017, and Ruth Amidzai Kemp's English language translation, The German Crocodile, which came out with digital back books as part of their Discover Africa Stories series in 2021. Ijoma Mangold was born to a black Nigerian father and a white German mother who herself was forced to escape the eastern province of Silesia as a refugee in the expulsions at the end of World War II. His father came to West Germany to train as a paediatric surgeon but returned before the young Ijoma was old enough to remember him. In the memoir, Mr Mangold looks back on his experience of, of growing up different and the twists and turns that his life took when his father re-entered his life decades later. I would like to thank Pro Vice-Chancellor Paul Inman, race champion on the university's senior management team for enabling our department to host this event. The event was supported by two further organisations, the Towards an Equitable German Studies Collective and the Reading German Network. Check out the EGS website for a blog post on teaching the German crocodile, as well as other suggested reading, and follow the German Reading Network on Twitter via the handle at German Reading One for upcoming German related events in the Berkshire area. You can also visit the Department of Languages and Cultures website for information on our outreach events for other languages. Thanks for watching and enjoy the recording. To just say a few words um, about Ijoma, our very special guest. Um, so um, he was born in 1971 in, in Heidelberg, a, a city that we, we all know, the wonderful University City of Heidelberg. He studied philosophy and literary studies in uh, Munich and uh, Bologna and then went on to have a career in, in, in journalism and in literary criticism, specifically working for the Berliner Zeitung, the Süddeutsche Zeitung, and then uh, laterally from 2009 um, for Die Zeit, uh, uh, Germany's uh, uh, heavyweight uh, a newspaper, in, a weekly newspaper in, in many respects. Uh, he was the literary editor-in-chief uh, initially at Die Zeit and um, is now the political cultural correspondent for um, Deed Sight. He is also uh, um, the co-presenter of Lesenswert on SVR, so the television uh, programme, um, and he's a jury member of, uh, or has been the jury member for um, several German literary prizes, including the German Book Prize and the Bachmann Prize. He is the recipient himself of the Berlin Prize for Literary Criticism, and uh, um, he held guest professorships at the University of Göttingen and Washington University in St. Louis, which is the last time we met, because that's my, my alma mater, that's where I did my PhD. So uh, um, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Ijoma. Uh, uh, <laughs> Um, so I'd like to just say some words about how I came to read uh, um, Das Deutsche um, Krokodil or the, Ger the German Crocodile and then perhaps we can talk a little bit about it and you could read uh, some excerpts in English and in German because I'm not sure that everyone here can um, <coughs> uh, understand German. So um, at Christmas time I took a nine hour train journey from Reading back home to Aberdeen and I get a little bit uh, um, uh, train uh, or, or travel sick and so I wanted something uh, uh, to 
to, to read but as an audiobook on, on, on the way to Aberdeen. And so I decided that I would listen uh, to this memoir, which I had heard had been recently translated into English, but I wanted to, to listen to, to the German. And the, the audiobook, if you, if you get a chance, is wonderful because it's actually Ijoma's voice that you will hear uh, reading, reading the audiobook. And um, as I got closer to Aberdeen, the, sort of the place that I came from, um, the, 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 one of the final chapters is a segment on St. Louis. Hello, welcome. Please take a seat. Um, thank you. One of the, the, the final section is on St. Louis, which is a city that, that, that I lived in. And so I was in the place that I'd come from, but was reading and listening, listening to the, the place. The, the furthest away place that I have been in my life. So it was a really wonderful uh, um, way to close the circle on my, my journey home. So thank you so much. There's so many interesting aspects in this. Uh, it's in, in English, the subtitle is a literary memoir and it's very much um, a text, I think, about texts. It's also a, a text I felt about textiles as well, or one textile in particular. So there's a carpet uh, in, in this memoir which um, comes up again and again. Uh, um, it's almost like a magic carpet because it appears even, even in Nigeria, uh, in the chapter in, in Nigeria. So I, I sort of thought there's something about um, the, the strands of, of stories and how over time they get compacted as well. And perhaps um, I, I, um, I, I could be destabilized uh, um, by, by a new thread uh, being introduced or, or one pulling, <coughs> pulling on a thread. So I thought that was an interesting uh, um, aspect of, of, of the book there. Um, in terms of the, the carpet is a, is, um, a reference to the, the home that um, you, you grew up in. And I wondered if you might be able to start by telling us a little bit about your childhood home. Oh yes, um, I'm very happy to be here and I'm glad so many students of you came. Um, you have to excuse my, my English, it's a little bit awkward, but um, since I talk only about my life, not about any philosophical thoughts, I think I will manage it. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm born, as you already said, 1971 in, in, in Germany, um, and the special conditions <laughs> of my childhood, where of course I, I, in a, in a, I, I looked different from everybody else. I had a strange first name. And when I was a small child, I, in a way, uh, I, uh, I felt, I thought this could be a high risk because I think as a child, you, I, when I was young, I loved normality. Of course, nowadays, no one want to be normal. Everybody tries to be an individualist. I mean, I guess you all know the famous movie Monty Python. There's one scene where everybody's kind of, we are all individualists <laughs> and only uh, Brian says, no, me not. <laughs> um, but in the seventies, in a way, I mean, for instance, um, my mother was a single mother. Now we have, this is a term, uh, almost a heroic term. It's like, oh, a single mother, and there's nothing more brave in this world than a single mother. At that time in the 70s, uh, it was, I think, more or less a, a kind of a irregularity where people thought, hmm, something wrong with that uh, household. I, I, I even remember in the 80s when I went to um, high school, um, if parents got divorced, which was not very often at that time, um, uh, uh, the children didn't tell in school because they were ashamed of it. Um, just to give you a little bit of, it's past, 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 <laughs> anyway. Um, my father, uh, yeah, my, 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 my father comes from Nigeria and um, he came to Heidelberg to study medicine and met my mother and um, went back to Nigeria when I was one year old. That means I have, I had no um, memories uh, to him. I didn't miss him and there was no, um, he, he, he was just not there. Um, um, uh, I remember quite well that my mother always tried to talk about him. So I get an idea of him because in a way she loved him very much and thought he's a very admirable person. Um, and the, and the, and the 
important narrative was in a way my father comes from Nigeria they from a from a small village and that village uh, they all were in a way putting together their money so he could study uh, abroad and therefore it was a matter of course for him of course he to return to Nigeria after he finished his studies and uh, he knew this my mother knew it and so they were in a way he, he didn't leave my mom and for my mother it was important telling me this um and at the same time uh, she thought i should have some consciousness about my about this part of my biography or this part of my heritage and um she, since she likes communicating anyway because she was a a psychotherapist and they like to talk a lot <laughs> children actually I would say don't like to talk a lot and they don't like it if parents talk too much <laughs> especially about things that are in a way intimate and for me I had I didn't had any problems with not having a father but I had a problem with talking with my mother about the absent father I thought okay it's all right if he's not here but why should I bother talking with my mother about him why should i bother reading african tales i hated african <laughs> nothing i hated more than african tales and stuff like this and yeah and, and of course there was this kind of i mean my different feature my different first name i really um uh, suffered by this first name because um if you meet a new person um it's always this situation where both parts are nervous and therefore society has invented certain rituals and one of those well-established rituals is to introduce yourself you say your name and then the other person says his name and the idea is okay then communication starts very um fluently um it didn't in my case because of course if i in, said my uh, my first name everybody said oh, oh wait a second can you please repeat it they were very curious they were very friendly it was not hostile at all not at all but it was always when it was my part it was somehow different uh, an exception okay so I, I repeated three three times my name then the other was very happy because now he was able to pronounce my name in the correct way and then they usually said oh wonderful you have such a special um name um you don't you are not a michael or an andreas or how people at that time um were called and of course i didn't say anything but um uh, in my heart i thought no no i would i, I really would prefer being called michael or stefan <laughs> um it's a destiny i was not um eager to, uh, to have and yeah but it was not only um this kind of challenge it was more i i actually think as a child i had quite a pessimistic view uh, on the world i was convinced if you look different than everybody else then you have a problem of course <laughs> not being like the average is always a risk and when I wrote the book and started thinking about myself and my childhood I was quite surprised because actually I didn't make uh, I haven't made any bad experiences not at all that nothing happened in my actual life uh, that uh, could have uh, brought me to this conviction so it was in a way a theoretical conviction I it, uh, sometimes I compare it to like like animals have how do you say in English fluchtreflex um, oh, uh, flight impulse or something yeah flight impulse so in a way uh, a, 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 a young animal has this flight impulse even if there is no uh, actual danger or a threat to it so it's something we inherited genetically I guess and um so I lived, I lived for some years um, in the expectations something bad could happen. For instance, like now it's a big subject. At that time it wasn't. The so-called, I don't know if I, I'm allowed to pronounce it here, 
the so-called N-word, mm -hmm. um, never happened. Never, never someone called me the N-word. But I, of course, I knew there exists, this word exists and people could try to insult me by using it. Um, but it never happened. But we have in German, I mean, you students of German language, we have the word negative, negative. And the first three um, letters are the same. So very long, maybe even nowadays, um, if someone says negative, I sort of like, for the first three letters, I think, oh, 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 how does this end? <laughs> and it always ended very fine. They always said negative. They never said the N word. Um, but there was some cautiousness mm -hmm. in a way. Um, I realized quite soon then when I went to elementary school um, that all my um, fears had no substance. There was, was no reason to fear anything. I, I realized that all my friends, they didn't even realize that I looked different. That was interesting. I just uh, interrupt myself. Uh, in, in November, I was in a nice literature festival somewhere in south of England. Um, what's Me? Sheltenham. Oh. Sheltenham Literature Festival. And there was another writer. She was maybe... I guess like 33, 34. And her book was about her experience to find out that she was black. She grew up in, I guess, the English part of Ireland um, with two Irish parents. Mm -hmm. And they didn't tell her that she was black. She was blacker than, much blacker than me. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not a visual thing. You have to, in a way, someone has to tell you. And um, it was, she was, uh, I guess, something like nine or 10 years old, if I remember her story correct, when she realized that she looked different and that her parents weren't her parents because they adopted her when she was a baby. Um, so um, the question, if you look different or not, is not a physical thing. It's more like kind of social construction or social perception you know, yeah. So as a child, I, I felt, I, I realized all my friends don't have any idea in that direction. So I was quite reassured um, and felt good because I thought maybe, maybe if I really, um, if I'm really good in it, I can, um, I can live this life as if I were a complete German. And that was my goal. And I had one problem, and that's uh, why we have that crocodile on the cover. Um, because my mother, I mean, she was in the 70s, she was a left woman. Um, at that time, you were, that was quite a fashion to be engaged for uh, poor African countries and stuff like that. So she really liked Africa in that sense. <laughs> um, and we had an, uh, a wooden crocodile on, uh, on fences things. How do you say? Yeah. And for me, that crocodile, of course, was a symbol of Africa. Yeah. Where, where does a crocodile come from? It exists only in Africa. Um, it, the, the wood was even black. And as a child, I thought, no, a real crocodile is green, but this one is black. Why is it black? Ah, because people in Africa are black and therefore also the crocodile is black. So if now my friends come to our place and they see that black, crocodile, then they finally realize that there's something wrong with that family. Um, but at the same time, I knew I cannot go to my mother and ask her, could we please remove the crocodile? Because I told you already, she was a psychotherapist. So I think <laughs> one of the first words I learned was the German word for Verdrängung. <laughs> Freudian expression. And I knew if I asked her to remove the crocodile, that would be a case of Verdrängung. Um, and Verdrängung was not good. You always had to talk about everything. <laughs> um, yeah, now, now I started talking and talking. Uh, next question. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> okay, maybe you're on the couch. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I was thinking about the material uh, um, circumstances of your youth. Your mother was, uh, um, she had a profession, um, but she was a single parent. So she, you know, mm. she only had one income coming coming yeah. in. So mm. I'm, I'm curious whether that had an, an impact on, uh, 
uh, on you? I have like, I don't know, 120 readings with that book and, and no one ever asked me that question, um, which surprises me because one idea of that book I would say is people always, of course, uh, people expect from this kind of book um, the report of what does it feel like to be confronted with racism and if this book is not, this is not supposed, the book is not supposed to have a message. It's a narrative. It's about individuality. It's not about some political insight. But one thing I think I, I try to make clear is that social um, discrimination is much more important than racial, at least in my life. And I would say in Germany and in that time. So with being ethnically different, it doesn't matter very much as long as you're socially well integrated or placed. So um, well, it's, yeah, it struck me. So and, yeah. and therefore, yeah. yeah, and therefore, uh, uh, one question that is, I think is very interesting. What are the things you are ashamed of? Um, and maybe as a very young child, I was ashamed of looking different, but that stopped very soon. But coming from a financially uh, precar precarious, precarious? Pre precarious family, um, in a way, even now with 51, I'm still ashamed of, which is ridiculous. Um, but had to do because it was my best friend in elementary school went to a certain school and I wanted to go to the same school. I didn't know anything about high school, that type of high school, but it was quite an elite institution, what we call humanistisches gymnasium, where you started with Latin and with Greek and Hebrew and stuff like that. <coughs> so um, in the fifth and sixth class, that didn't matter at all. But then everybody, everyone can ask himself, when was the first time you realized that you belong to a certain class? I mean, this is uh, you are English, so you know much more about class society than we Germans because we Germans think there is there are no classes, so we are not that sharp in um, um, observing it. Um, and when I realized, of course, uh, all my friends come from much wealthier uh, family backgrounds than me, um, then, uh, uh, for instance, I started uh, trying not inviting my friends to my place because they lived in nice villas above the river looking to the castle and we had a small apartment not small no it wasn't small <laughs> <laughs> a three room apartment <laughs> um but money was always lacking and for instance even the carpet couldn't be restored because money uh, was left and and I know when my grandmother from the Black Forest came, she also, she was like me and I was like her. We thought my mother didn't handle things right. And it's very shaming um, that the uh, carpet is in that kind of conditions. Yeah. yeah. Well, it struck me that it was a book possibly about class. Yeah, you know? I think so. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, my favorite writer is Master Proust. I would say the whole research, research um, it is a book about very fine distinctions of uh, social differences, yeah. Yeah, class, social differences and social, sorry, cultural capital yes, as well. Absolutely. It, it seemed to me to be yeah. one, you know, one of the main themes. Because that was my salvation. Yeah. Um, when I thought it's a problem um, that we are not wealthy like the other parents on my school, then of course, at a certain point, I realized, oh, all the parents of my friends are admiring me and my mother because Although we don't have money, we go to the opera house. And that was, of course, in this university, like Heidelberg, being rich was okay, but being poor and going to the opera, that's the best you could do. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, um, I, I, I'd like to perhaps hear you read a little bit from uh, from the memoir. And I was thinking, hopefully we haven't gone too far away now from your childhood, but if you could perhaps read one of an excerpt about uh, um, one of the books that you read as a, as a young child. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought maybe we could talk afterwards about, about the, well, the meaning of, yeah. of that book for you. And this passage, mm -hmm. I, I read in German or in English? Or both, or? Um, could you read it in both if that would be? And in which language I should start? Okay, <laughs> what do we vote for? Um, start with uh, German, I think. Yeah, would that be okay? Yeah. yeah. Für das Bilderbuch, wo die wilden Kerle wohnen, muss er all seinen Mut zusammennehmen. Wie kann man nur so verwegen sein wie der Junge in der Geschichte? Der wird von seiner Mutter, weil er mal wieder nur Unfug gemacht hat, ohne Abendessen ins Bett geschickt. Trotzig schaut er auf die verschlossene Tür. Zimmerarrest. Aber so leicht bricht man seinen Willen nicht. Das Zimmer verwandelt sich in einen Wald, dann in die ganze Welt. Der Junge besteigt ein Segelboot, das so heißt wie er selbst, Max. Max, Kapitän auf eigene Faust. Er zeigt es der Mutter, meine Geduld ist erschöpft, ich segle über die Meere. Von mir wirst du nie wieder ein Sterbenswörtchen hören. Du wirst mir nachweinen, aber dann ist es zu spät. Schließlich landet er auf einer Insel, es ist die Insel, wo die wilden Kerle wohnen. Schon kommen sie aus dem Urwald hervor. Die wilden Kerle sehen wirklich gruselig aus, die Körper behaart, die Augen funkeln wie Blitze. Statt Fingern haben sie Krallen. Selbst ihre Fußzehen winden sich zu Klauen. Max, seiner Sache keineswegs sicher, betrachtet sie mit einem gewissen Abstand. Die Stimmung scheint zu kippen. Doch dann erinnert er sich seiner angeborenen Herrscher Natur und schaut den wilden Kerlen in die Augen, ganz fest, ohne mit der Wimper zu zucken. So bezwingt er sie und die wilden Kerle unterwerfen sich ihm. Sie krönen ihn zum König. Jetzt darf Max bestimmen und er bestimmt. Wir machen Krach. Alle brüllen, was das Zeug hält. Alle springen in die Luft. Sie heulen den Mond an und angeln sich wie Affen an den Ästen der Bäume entlang. Doch irgendwann erschöpft sich jeder Spaß und mit der Müdigkeit kommt Traurigkeit und Einsamkeit. Dieser Urwald ist doch gar nicht sein wahres Zuhause. Diese Palmen sind ihm nicht vertraut. Es ist eine fremde Welt. Und die wilden Kerle sind schon furchterregend. Auch wenn er ihr König ist, er wird nie wirklich zu ihnen gehören. Anders als sie hat er ja eine Mutter. Zeit für die Einreise. Max besteigt das Segelboot. Die wilden Kerle brechen zum Abschied wieder in ihr Ohren betäubendes Geschrei aus. Das ist nicht böse gemeint, es ist einfach ihre Art, Max zu zeigen, dass sie ihn schon jetzt vermissen. Während der Fahrt schläft Max bei ruhigem Meer, günstigen Wind. Als er aufwacht, ist er wieder in seinem Zimmer. Mondlicht fällt durchs Fenster. Auf dem Tisch steht das Abendessen. Es ist sogar noch warm. Die Sterne stehen vollzählig über dem Land. Die Mutter lässt einen nie im Stich dass er aus einem fernen Land kommt und der König der wilden Kerle ist, muss er ja niemandem erzählen. Now I try to read it in English. Um, when, I, when I first had to read from the English transla translation, I was like um, cursing myself for having written such a difficult German <laughs> because I'm able to read that difficult German, but not very good reading the difficult English. So please excuse if some words are mispronounced. Because in my conviction, it's like Americans enjoy bad English. British, in a way, they look down to you if you don't speak proper English. Is it true? <laughs> I, 
I also I'm, I'm, I'm a journalist. I work as a journalist. Very often, I make also interviews with um, international writers, and I uh, always prefer interviewing an American writer um, more than an English one. <laughs> The boy has to take a deep breath before opening the picture book where the wild things are. How can anyone be as audacious as Max, the boy in the story, who, because of all the mischief he makes, gets sent to bed without his supper? Max scolds defiantly at his bedroom door. But his will can't be broken, not that easily. His bedroom turns into a forest, then the whole world. The boy steps into his boat, which bears his name, Max, captain of his own ship. He will show Mama. That's it. I've had enough. I'm sailing across the seas. You will never hear from me again. You will cry when I'm, go when I when I'm gone, but, I but it will be too late. He ends up on an island. The island where the wild things live. Here they come, emerging from the forest. They are ferocious, fearsome, with hairy bodies, eyes sparkling like, like lightning, talons for fingers. Even their toes are claws. Max looks on from a distance, by no means sure of himself. The mood seems to shift a gear, but then he remembers his innate leadership, and he looks the wild things in the eye directly without flinching. And thus, he subdues them. The wild things submit and crown him their king. Now Max is in charge, his wish is their command. Let the wild rumpus start, he commands. The wild things roar with all their might, dance and leap about, hole at the moon, and shuffle like apes along the branches of the trees. But good things always have to come to an end, and with tiredness comes sadness and loneliness. This jungle isn't really home. These palm trees aren't what's, what he's used to. This is a foreign land, and the wild things are actually a bit scary. Even if he's their king, he will never really be one of them. Unlike them, he's got a mama. Time to go home. Max steps into his boat. As he bids them farewell, the wild things break out into their deafening holes. They don't mean it badly. It's just their way of showing Max that they already miss him. Max sleeps as he sails over calm seas with a favorable wind. When he wakes up, he's back in his room. Moonlight streams in through the window. His supper's waiting for him, still warm. The stars are looking down on him. His mother would never let him down. He doesn't need to explain to anyone that he's from a distant land and that he's the king of the wild things. Thank you so much. There's so many interesting aspects to uh, uh, um, that excerpt, and I think if you had a you know post-colonial lens to to read that through, then there there's just so much to say about it. But before I do, I wanted to point something out which might not be obvious to the audience. Um, heeding that as the first excerpt from the book, which is the the very the, the first section of the book um, is entitled "The Junge" or "The Boy," and it's written in the third person. So you're writing about your your former your mm. former self, but d distancing your your, mm. your your present self, I guess, from from uh, um, your your childhood self. Um, and it struck me when I read that that der Junge is is used. You know, this text is also quoted in the third person, and there seems to be a potentially a blooding you note know, of identification between the reader and and Max as as well mm. by, by by this repetition of the boy and the fact that it's it's told in the third person. Um yeah the um 
the quote about Max having innate leadership, the fact that he's, he sails, he leaves, he leaves a kind of place of comfort and sails off to another country where, uh, or another land uh, um, where uh, people look very different and, um, and, and he subdues them uh, uh, and they, they, they kind of uh, uh, um, yield to his, to his will. But then when he decides that it's time you know, for a play to end, he's the one that determines that it's over and, and, and um, he's obviously the focaliser, things end when he returns. I'm curious um, whether you could say some more about why you chose to incorporate this text and what kind of messaging this, this type of text um, had for you as a young boy. Um, I think, do you know that book? In German it's very famous, yeah. Um, I think, I would think that the most children identify with the Max leaving his home, mm -hmm. going to that big adventure. And in my case, I would say, it well, the other way around. I was identifying with um, Max relief when he is home again, okay, the adventure was good, no question, but knowing there is a home um, uh, was the more touching message to me. And yeah, you, you use the word post-colonial, I actually don't know exactly what it means, but um, as a child, I was afraid there were certain cliches about Africa that I didn't, wanted to be associated with them. And of course, jungle was something that didn't exist in Germany. In Germany, we have the forest, mm -hmm. not the jungle. So um, in a way, I was afraid that people could think I belong more to the jungle than to the forest. And when I read that book, um, in a way I was afraid, is this something, is uh, this book, a uh, uh, hundred fun um, um, deals with deals with with my African part of origin, and therefore it was so important to no 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 I leave the jungle and return to the steady home or where the, uh, the supper uh, uh, is still warm and um, all these kinds of reflections. Of course, I didn't made in that explicit as a child but uh i remember i think my sentiments went in this direction and um my grandmother my german grandmother um died 1993 and that was when she was in the hospital and was clear she will die very soon it was like two weeks before i uh, travel for the first time to Nigeria because I grew up, I told you already, without my father, we had no contact. And when I was 22, I received a letter. Um, we can talk about it later. So I'm in the hospital um, uh, where my grandmother uh, is in the bed and I had, I had a very, very close uh, relationship to my grandmother. And, and she um, tears me uh, down to his Bad, and she knows I will leave in a week to visit Nigeria. And um, she says to me, but please come back. And I was really terrified. I thought, uh, grandmother, what are you thinking? I mean, I'm belonging here. It's, it's terrible that I leave Germany while you are in the hospital. Um, but this, that my grandmother, to, to which I had such a close relation in both directions, could have this fear I, that I could not return means in a way she, she, also, she thought the power of blood could be so strong or something else, I don't know what, maybe, or okay, my father, a famous uh, doctor in Africa and chief there, maybe the social attraction of the African family is so strong that um, her grandchild uh, uh, will stay there. I don't know. Um, uh, but it has to do with the, sa the same situation. And therefore, I, I think I always identified very much with Max returning to his mother. Um, that was, in a way, always my, 
that all of it. That's fascinating. When I compared the translation with the original, I think you say much um, fasten, mm -hmm. so has to kind of gather his, his courage. And in English, it's been translated as takes a deep breath. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I felt that perhaps the, 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 the danger uh, 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 aspect or dangerous aspect was, was possibly missing from the English translation. And I wanted to ask what it was that you were afraid of, if you were afraid of something, like why you had to sort of uh, 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 muster all your courage to, to read it. But I think I think you've explained that, that mm -hmm. to me now. Um, in terms of the letter, I was thinking about the text in, um, in terms of, um, it's been described as a coming of age story. Uh, um, and I think of, I don't know about you, but I think of coming of age stories as, as kind of, uh, um, as focusing on, on, on youth uh, and kind of the, the, the sort of turning point at, at sort of late teen, maybe or, or early 20s when one becomes a, an adult, perhaps. And it, it seemed to me that perhaps it was a coming of ages novel because there are multiple points when there's, I think the term might be anagnosis, you know, when you, when you sort of learn something new, which then kind of changes your perspective. And, and um, it's not only, I, I believe at least, it's not only when you're 22 that, 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 that something new comes into, mm. new knowledge comes into your life, um, mm. but also later in your life. But maybe you could tell us a little bit about this letter that you received when you were 22. Yeah. Um, if your own mother tells you you have a wonderful father, but we don't have contact, she has to justified and there was a narrative who should explain it because of course my father would marry again in Nigeria and have an own family and that another wife shouldn't be jealous therefore they both my father and my mother had decided that there is no contact I don't know if this is true I mean this kind of books I would generalize you start writing when all the persons involved are dead <laughs> as long as they live for some strange reasons um uh, all the questions i now have i never had as long as my mother was alive and she would have loved it if i had, had uh, if i only had asked her but i didn't and she died 2010 and i started writing that book, book 2015 um so there are of course a lot of um not dark spots, but things I, I mean, everybody, everyone is deceiving oneself. And also my mother as a psychotherapist will also have deceived in a way herself, I guess, but hard to say in which respect. For instance, if someone asked me about race, uh, racist experiences, I would say, no, never. Writing that book and then talking to other friends of my mother, uh, it turned out, oh no, it must be different. But my mother tried to protect me. So that happened things I actually remember. Um, but she told me she interpreted them different. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be harmed in my soul. Anyway, the what I uh, like to say is my mother said that's, uh, that's very natural that we have no uh, communication because there is that not new family and so on. To me, it didn't matter. I was, for me, it was, I was happy there was that new wife and therefore there was no communications because I, the, the, the only thing I really uh, didn't want uh, is at that time that all of a sudden my father comes in um, and of course I had no emotional relation to him at all. Um, I think you cannot have an emotion, a true emotional relation to a person that didn't exist. So, and I was very happy with my life. I was not missing anything. Maybe, I, I, yeah, okay, in, in that technical se sense, I missed a father uh, because I thought with a complete family, we would be richer. And of course I would approve to that. Um, but not in an, but there was no emotional deficit, I would say. Of course, at a certain 
time when I was 16 or 17, I realized that I had always very good relationships to the fathers of my friends. <laughs> I guess it had a reason, I don't know. So um, when I was 22, I was already a student in Munich and um, came back from vacations in Greece. And there was a letter in my um, letterbox. Um, and that was this kind of very um, cheap, um, group, um, rough, rough paper. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even see any name. I saw only that the material of the envelope. And I knew in that very moment, shit, a letter from my father. <laughs> Finally, it happened. Oh no, oh no. And um, yeah, and it was like this. There was Godwin Hospital. Yeah, I knew my father as a doctor. Mm -hmm. Was a rumba as a boyke. That's the name of my father. And I walked the stairways up to my small student apartment, and I hadn't opened the letter yet, but I knew, I knew what would expect me. It was clear. My father would say. You were always my son, and now I'm glad that we can meet and uh, stuff like this. And I knew it's not that's not what I want. But at the same time, um, I had no doubt how I would react because I'm a decent, well-educated person. And if you're a decent and well-educated person, if your father writes your letter, of course you answer. And if your father says come visit me in Nigeria, of course you go to Nigeria and visit him. I mean, what would your friends think if you tell them, no, 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 I didn't, I, I just ignored the letter. No, that doesn't work. Then they think you, you're crazy. Um, and of course I knew my mother would, wouldn't allow it. My mother was in a way always very liberal, but there were some certain things like piano lessons. <laughs> she was really strict and, um, and terms of uh, and the way I had to behave against my father, she was also in a way strict, it was clear. For, for her, when I, when, when I told her, he wrote me, she was like, I always told you, you are a wonderful father. Now he is, he is, he is here. Um, yeah. And then I made, it's, it's also an intercultural, Interkulturelle mm -hmm. Kommunikation is yeah, it's a, also an intercultural novel, my book, um, because um, nowadays, of course, there are plenty of people with uh, intercultural parents and they participate into different cultures. Um, but I always would say to my defense, um, it is hard to find another country in this world which habits are such different from the German ones like Nigeria. So um, it was a real challenge and it started yeah, it had to do a lot, I guess, with a certain uh, culture of communication. For instance, in that letter my father wrote blood is thicker than water. That was the only explanation or the only, uh, he didn't say anything else. I, he never asked me, also in the next 10 years, he never asked me, how was your childhood? How, <laughs> what did you do in those 20 years we didn't see? No, he wrote me, I'm glad blood is thicker than water. Nigeria is your, is your fatherland. Um, all your sisters um, are absolutely happy that they have a brother. And I thought, that's strange. I mean, I was at that time quite narcissistic. I thought, of course, you should, everybody should be glad to have me as a brother. But to be happy, you have to know me. And they didn't know me. And they were already enthusiastic about the fact. And that was actually the basic experience for all the Nigerian relationships. The laugh and the friendship and the closeness and all those wonderful virtues they felt for me was always given from the first moment. And as a German who learned that everything has to be like Jürgen Habermas, you have to discuss things and you have, you, you, there's, you're not genetically determined 
uh, blood doesn't play any role. In my view, as a young man, I thought, no, feeling close to someone is something that has to be arbeited. Um, mm -hmm. You have to deserve it. You have to work for it. Yeah, you have yeah. to work for it. It <laughs> cannot be just because of our relationship, because we are brothers and sisters. But that's if I travel to Nigeria, everybody, um, even and you have a, the family is huge, so there are a lot of cousins I've never seen once in my life and forget. Uh, uh, they all feel from the very beginning uh, very close to me. And when I was 22, 23, I thought that's strange. Now I really know, can appreciate it. Um, I think the older you become, the more you realize that the kind of individualistic motivated relations we have in the Western world are maybe overestimated, <laughs> overrated. Um, but everything that was challenging to me. I mean, the, my, my Nigerian family is a wonderful family. Um, my sisters are wonderful uh, uh, people, um, but it was a challenge because for my father, it was from, it was crystal, crystal clear uh, that what, what the will of my father was to transfer me completely to Nigeria. And um, for instance, he, uh, he had a hospital there. He was a doctor, he had a hospital. Um, he was offering me, uh, I should um, take over uh, the ownership of the hospital. I was a student of literature and philosophy. I said, That's right. that, that doesn't make sense. Um, my oldest sister, Ikuna, she studied at that time also medicine in Heidelberg. I said, transfer to her. She's becoming a doctor. It's great. It works. It fits. Uh, of course, no, it's a part patriarchal mm -hmm. society and and my father in the village he comes from he was a chief which is more than just no it's a real office mm -hmm. in a way um and all these things are connected with an idea of dynasty uh but uh, over the male line of course and that was the problem of my father. I realized, okay, I have, first I have to say, my father wrote that letter and he wrote, said, you have four sisters and the eldest one studies in Heidelberg. She will call you up and then visit you in Munich. So three weeks later, Ikuna arrived in Munich and um, with her then her boyfriend. And um, she told me, of course, a lot about our family. And she told me also about a tragedy in that family. Um, there is a genetic disease, especially in Western Africa, sickle cell disease. Um, and if both parents have a certain genetic disposition, um, then the likelihood that the children uh, get that disease is very high, very high, like 40%. And if you get the disease, it's deadly. And, um, that was the case by my father and his uh, uh, wife, her name is Joyce. Um, so my father or my, fam my Nigerian family lost two sons on, uh, like 10 months <laughs> before my father wrote that letter. For Ikuna, when she told me about the loss of our brothers, she didn't think in that categories but when i listened to that story i thought ah that's the reason why he has written me because now he has no sons and, th and at that point of the story he realizes no 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 there is another one and uh calls me up and from a western perspective this looks maybe a little bit harsh but it he didn't mean it harsh. It was just the traditional, it made, made sense for him to act like this. And actually he's a great person. He's dead, but he was a great person. I did, I never felt close to him, but I liked his, I mean, it's his attitude. I'm very much like him actually, which is very strange, which is also a very interesting experience because growing up in Germany in the seventies and the eighties, of course, not, it was clear, nothing is genetic. 
everything is social uh, socialization. Socialization. Yeah. It's not true. Even the way I I laugh is the way my father laughs. My mother was socially a very modest person. My father not so much. I'm completely like my father, for instance. <laughs> um, yeah, when I was, okay, the funny thing is, my father bought two flight tickets for Ikuna and me, Ikuna, studying in Heidelberg. We should travel together to Nigeria for two months. That was like eight months after that letter. Two weeks before we take off, he rings, calls me up and says, small um, uh, changes uh, on my side, but shouldn't uh, bother you at all. My father had a kidney disease. He needed dialysis, dialysis. Dial dialysis. And now he had the, had the chance to um, get a kidney transplantation, actually from his sister. And uh, that operation should uh, should take place in Bochum, in the hospital in Bochum. So my father, actually, when I traveled with my sister to Nigeria, my father was in Germany. So uh, I didn't. Uh, I, I have I didn't see him in Nigeria. I saw him before we left. Uh, I visited him in uh, in the hospital, and um, he opens the door, and um, the first thing he's doing he gives me a pre present, mm -hmm. and I open and he tells me to open it, and there's a white um, rope, rope mm -hmm. like the chiefs are wearing it, and uh, we have not talked to each other more than three sentences when he says, please take on that rope. And he himself took on his rope. Both we had uh, took on that white uh, chief rope and my sister had to take a picture of us. And, and that was like I, the first 10 minutes I knew my father and I knew at that moment I knew how things go in Nigeria. <laughs> and I knew, aha, okay, now you are the, the prince and the prince that is supposed to act in in a certain way. And when I was in Nigeria without my father, I, I liked his wife very much. She still is alive, I like her. Um, very often we were invited to wealthy neighbors. Um, and at the beginning I was, uh, I didn't, I thought it's normal. I mean, I, I thought a little bit strange that there's always one very young daughter of the house mm -hmm. who never says any word at all. Um, and then, I, of course, I realized, ah, they, it's not only that I realized, uh, that, uh, Joyce also told me, don't feel pressure on you, but we just want to offer you um, <laughs> what is possible. <laughs> very important family. They, they are important uh, toilet paper producers. <laughs> um, so the expectation my father had were very high and for me it was very clear I cannot meet the expectations. But at the same time there was another more psychological problem. Um, maybe I felt a little bit harmed or hurt because Yeah, I, I, in a way, I felt used. I, I knew, okay, it's very honorable in a way what they are offering me, but they do it with intentions. Um, and they disrespect my own biography. I was a, at that time, not now it's different a little bit. At that time, I was like, for me, that was my strategy uh, how to cope with the fact I look different from everybody else. I became more German than any German. There's no one in Germany in my generation who knows our traditions so well um, and stuff like this. And I identified very much with it. Um, and then to deal with a father who is like annihilating those 20 years of my biography uh, uh, by trying to push me to a completely different world um, was psychologically not easy to deal with, not easy. You can live with it, but um, 
what I like to say, the relation between my father and me always ha had that burden. Yeah. Yeah. I knew I disappointed him and he realized, okay, all his plans don't uh, uh, work out as... <laughs> Even my, my eldest sister, Kuna, she lived after finishing um, her studies in Heidelberg. She moved to England. Now she moved to Canada two years ago, but she lived like 15 or 20 years uh, in Essex as a, as a doctor. And she was sometimes a little impatient with me in sense of why do you act so much like a German? You are Nigerian. <laughs> And then she married a Nigerian uh, guy in England and had two children with him. So my, uh, my nephew and my niece, wonderful children. Sarah now is 15 and Ezra 12. Both are 100%, like we talk about blood, they both are 100% um, Nigerian. I'm only 50%. Both have Nigerian parents who educated them. The first, I was 22, but I, for the first time, was uh, even uh, confronting a Nigerian person. And when my sister Kuna at a certain point realizes that her both children are 100% British, <laughs> at that point she understood her brother better. <laughs> and then she forgave, forgave me. Yeah, of course, it is. There is that um, uh, Nigerian um, thinking, like um, the identification uh, goes via blood, but it's not that way, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it makes me think about, you know, what I said in the beginning about, the, you know, uh, mm -hmm. stories being a text and, and perhaps um, the, the, the stories, you know, unraveling, but it sounds yeah. like the, your, your father and you had two completely different song sheets you know they, yeah. Yeah, they, they yeah, weren't, yeah they weren't they weren't yeah even interacting at yeah. all um, i think we've reached exactly five o'clock i was really hoping to hear a little bit more uh, from you do you think we could hear one more extract would that be okay and um, i sort of think that it would be interesting to hear about the broader uh, um, developments socially and politically and um, around the world and what kind of influence that had on mm. the way that you were perceived within germany and we discussed earlier the segment where you discuss Obama mm -hmm. and the difference that uh, um, Obama's presidency mm -hmm. had on, on, mm -hmm. on your life. I wondered if you would mind reading from that section. Shall we yes. read both the German and the English? Would that be okay for people? Yeah. Um, or what would you prefer? To read the, the German and the English or just... You have to decide. Okay. Um, can we hear the German then if that's, if that's okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. But I, I like to say some words before I read that passage. I mean, now I, I, I said it several times, like ne never made any racist experiences. I made another experience, I guess when I was 17, 18, and uh, therefore I, 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 I realized the Germans love it to ask me about racist experiences. And then they, of course, were always very disappointed when I said I don't have any story to tell. Um, but then I realized, okay, there's a certain psychological game on the way. Because if you, as a German, ask for racist experiences, you express that you are very sensible. Okay. So the racists, of course, are always the other people. And if you ask, uh, did you suffer, you're on the good side. And of course, I didn't, since I also, I always a very, very much a contrarian, um, uh, I didn't want it to play this game. But if I then said there was never any racist experiences, it's also only the half truth. The other part of the truth is not racism, but is the fact that, of course, if you look different, this is a constant not a constant challenge, but you deal with it in a way, even maybe only unconscious, but you, you, it, it, in a way, whatever you do, you do it in the consciousness of 
not looking exactly like the majority. And my, my German, um, uh, people say my German is uh, uh, terribly sharp, exaggerated sharp. And that was already in school. And my friends in school said, we think you talk the way you talk to demonstrate that there's no clearer and purer German uh, uh, than yours. And um, I think that could be true. For me, I know other people see it different. For me, the only really colorblind city, I know you different generation, for you colorblindness is something terrible, something that we have to overcome. Um, but I'm the old generation, I'm the Martin Luther King child. I think it's good if we are colorblind. Um, and Los Angeles, I always uh, considered as a colorblind city. Singapore as well, but too difficult. But Los and in New York, I, if I'm in New York, I have the feeling that, of course, there's a lot of diversity, but everyone is marking his own identity. In Los Angeles, there is no such thing as ethnic identity because it's too much mixed up. And when I stayed seven years ago in Los Angeles for a month, um, I was in a way so lighthearted without realizing why. And then I started thinking, how, what could it be? And then I realized, ah, okay, no, maybe for the first time in your life, you, you don't think you have to act to deal with that, with, with that fact, because now you're really like everybody else. In Los Angeles, you're really like everybody else. For instance, I, I, I like going to good restaurants. Eating was a major subject in my life from the very beginning. Um, and if you go in a, in a very good restaurant, it never happened, but it could happen that the waiter thinks you are the guy who cleans up the dishes and says, there's the kitchen. It never happened, but it, because it could be possible, I guess I started to behave in a way that no one ever who sees me has the idea my place could be in the kitchen. So I, but that means I, that means I had always to overperform. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I, uh, when I uh, stayed in Los Angeles, I think that was this feeling of relief. I, I felt like, I oh, know here, I don't have to compensate or overperform. So that's a good in introduction for the passage I read now, but you will uh, quickly understand why we start in German. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Als ich im Herbst 1988, diese Passage fängt mit seinem Rückblick an, nochmal in die Schulzeit, als ich im Herbst 1988 mit Freunden in die Toskana fuhr, saßen wir in einer Osteria in Cortona. Das Essen war gut, der Wein auch. Ich hatte den ersten Brunello meines Lebens getrunken und begriffen, was man als Deutscher vor allem war. Italiener. Der Wirt hatte gute Laune. Und irgendwann kam er an unseren Tisch, klopfte mir auf die Schulter und sagte, Ah, Maradona. <lacht> Diego Maradona spielte damals für den SSC Neapel und wurde von den Italienern wie ein Gott verehrt. Die Titulierung durch den Wirt war als Freundlichkeit gemeint. Natürlich sah ich nicht wie Maradona aus, es sei denn, man unterteilte die ganze Welt in Weiß und alle anderen in The Rest and the Rest. Dann freilich gehörte ich eher ins Maradona-Lager, wobei die Frage blieb, auf welcher Seite der selber ziemlich dunkelhäutige toskanische Wirt unter diesen Umständen zu verbuchen gewesen wäre. Zehn Jahre später, Fußball-WM in Frankreich, 1998. Der Star und Sympathieträger der brasilianischen Mannschaft war der Stürmer Ronaldo mit den schiefen Zähnen und dem leichten Bauchansatz. Jetzt hieß es scherzhaft, Du siehst ja aus wie Ronaldo. Das kam der Sache schon näher, war aber immer noch ein ziemlich grober Vergleich. Doch dann, noch einmal zehn Jahre waren vergangen, 
war alles anders. Schien es mir nur so oder war plötzlich überall von einem Schwarzen die Rede? Ein junger Senator aus Illinois hatte sich auf den Weg gemacht, um die Präsidentschaftskandidatur der Demokraten zu erkämpfen. Wenn man von ihm sprach, musste man sich konzentrieren, um nicht aus Versehen Osama Bin Laden zu sagen. Manchmal wurde er anfänglich auch noch mit seinem zweiten Namen Hussein vorgestellt. Naja, schon wenige Wochen später erschien es einem nur noch absurd, dass man je die Namen Osama Bin Laden und Barack Obama für verwechselbar gehalten hatte. Ich war perplex. Dieser Mann war schwarz, aber er kam weder aus dem Showbusiness noch aus dem Sport. So gesehen erfüllte er die alte Forderung meiner Mutter. Trotzdem war ich überfordert, äh, trotzdem war ich abwartend. Würden jetzt alle Leute ständig über einen Schwarzen reden? So etwas hat es noch nie gegeben. Würde es Folgen für mich haben? Würde es das Ende meiner Unsichtbarkeit sein, in der ich mich doch gut aufgehoben gefühlt hatte? Betraf mich die Sache wohl gar persönlich? Damals arbeitete ich als Literaturredakteur im Feuilleton der Süddeutschen Zeitung. Ein kluger und sympathischer Kollege, ausgewiesener Kenner der USA und ihrer Literatur, der nur manchmal in der Redaktion vorbeischaute, steckte eines Tages mit vielsagendem Gesichtsausdruck, doch auch etwas besorgt, ob er damit wohl die Grenze des Geziemenden überschritte, seinen Kopf durch die Tür meines Büros und sagte in seinem schlonzigen Bayerisch, also der Barack Obama und sie, ihr seht euch ja total ähnlich. Da war mir klar, die Sache würde wohl wirklich etwas mit mir zu tun haben. Das konnte ja heiter werden. Fingen die Leute jetzt an, mich nicht mehr als Deutschen zu sehen, sondern als jemanden, der etwas mit einem afroamerikanischen Politiker aus Chicago gemeinsam hatte? Das musste ich mir genauer anschauen. Kaum hatte der Kollege mein Büro verlassen, googelte ich Obama-Fotos. Ein Zacken dunkler war er schon, aber er gefiel mir gut. Es gab eigentlich keinen Grund zu protestieren. Ich konnte mit dem Vergleich leben, weil derjenige, mit dem ich verglichen wurde, erstmals in meinem Leben einen ähnlichen Bildungshintergrund hatte wie ich selbst. Zumindest, wenn man an Maradona und Ronaldo dachte. Das war ein Fortschritt. Gerade war ich noch im Tantris gewesen, wo Deutschlands erster Drei-Sterne-Koch Ecker Witzigmann mit einem 18-gängigen amis göll menü geehrt worden war. Viele seiner Schüler waren angereist, und mischten sich mit dem Münchner Promi-Publikum. Der Champagner, wie es dann immer heißt, floss in Strömen. Und wir waren alle sehr betrunken, als ein Koch aus Wien mit schwerer Zunge zu mir sagte, und für wen spürst du? Das war nicht nett. Zum Glück wies ihn ein Winzer aus der Steiermark streng zurecht. Mir selber war im Schreck der Beschämung keine passende Entgegnung eingefallen. So eine Szene, das wurde mir in dem Moment indem ich anfing, Obama zu googeln, klar, wird es künftig nicht mehr geben. Obama war mein Mann. And now in English? Yes, please, thank you. I wonder how Root has translated this Austrian slang. I went to Tuscany with friends once in autumn 1988. This was before the summer trip to Umbria. We were sitting. This was before the summer trip to Umbria. Umbria that doesn't, doesn't exist in the German version. Right? <laughs> Strange. <laughs> What happened there? We were, ah, no, now I realize. No, uh, that is the, I always read from this book and I, I have uh, uh, underlined, uh, durchgestrichen. Oh, crossed out. He had closed out that part of the sentence for the readings yeah. and therefore I thought, ah, okay, no, no. <laughs> Everything okay. <laughs> I went to Tuscany with friends once in autumn 1988. We were sitting in, in an Osteria in Cortona. The food was good as was well the wine. I tasted my first Brunello and, and understood what I was, above all, to be German, what it was, above all, to be German. 
the love of Italy. The landlord was a cheerful type and he came over to our table, patted me on the shoulder and said, ah, Maradona. Diego Maradona played for SSC Napoli at the time and was worshipped like a god by the Italians. The landlord's appellation for me was clearly meant as camaraderie. Of course, I didn't look in the slightest like Maradona, unless the whole world was divided into white and everyone else, or the rest and the rest. In that case, I suppose I belonged more in the Maradona camp, but then there was the question of which side the rather dark-skinned Tuscan restaurant owner would have been on. Ten years later, France was hosting the FIFA World Cup. The beloved star of the Brazilian team was the striker Ronaldo with, with his crooked teeth and slight punch. Punch. Punch? Punch. Punch. Now people joked, he looked like Ronaldo. That was perhaps closer, but it was still a pretty imprecise comparison. But then another 10 years passed and everything was different again. There was a black man who everyone seemed to be talking about. Or was I just imagining it? A young Illinois senator was a contender for the Democratic presidential candidate. When speaking about him, you had to be careful not to accidentally say Osama bin Laden. Sometimes, in the early days, he was introduced with his second name as well, Hussein. Whereas just a few weeks into the presidential race, it already seemed absurd that anyone could ever confuse the names Osama bin Laden and Barack Obama. But I was flummoxed. Never heard of this word. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one, yeah. <laughs> this man was black, but he wasn't from showbiz or sport, a rare individual who fulfilled my mother's stipulation of old. All the same, I was biding my time to see what would become of it. Was there now going to be a black man who was constantly the topic of, of conversation? There had never been anything like this. Would this have consequences for me? Would it spell the end of my invisibility that had helped me feel secure? Would it affect me personally? <coughs> At the time, I was working as literary editor for the Süddeutsche Zeitung. A, coll a colleague of mine, a smart and likable chap, and a proven connoisseur of the USA and its literature, who only occasionally stopped by the editorial office, stuck his head around my door one day. He had a meaningful expression on his face, but also looked a little anxious that he might be crossing the line of what was appropriate. In his heavy Bavarian drawl, he said, isn't that Barack Obama a spitting image of you? It was clear by now that I really wasn't going to be left out of it. Okay, deep breath. This was going to be fun. Were people now, were people now going to stop seeing me as German and instead as someone who had something in common with an African-American politician from Chicago, I had to take a closer look. No sooner had my colleague gone than I started Googling photos of Obama. He was a bit darker than me, but I liked the look of him. He had no objections about the comparison. Uh, I'm sorry, I had no objections. I had no objections about the comparison. After all, for the first time in my life, I was being compared to someone who had a similar educational background to myself, closer at least than Maradona and Ronaldo. This was progress. I had just been to Tantras to a meal hosted in honor of Germany's first three-star chef, Eka Witzigmann, an 18-course Amus Busch menu. A lot of his apprentices had come to mingle with the Munich PR set. The champagne was flowing and we were all a bit tipsy when a cook from Vienna slurred, 
So what do you play for then? Uh, sorry. So who do you put? So who do you play for then? That didn't feel great. Fortunately, a vintner from Styria gave him a severe rebuck. In my embarrassed shock, I was lost for words. The moment I started Googling Obama, I realized scenes like this would soon be a thing of the past. Obama was my man. I would have much to gain personally from his presidency. And besides, I had also succumbed to his charm like millions of others. But my inner glow wasn't kindled so much by the black Obama as Obama the intellectual. It wasn't the fact that such a smart, highly educated man might move into the White House more astonishing than the admittedly historically unprecedented fact of a black man potentially becoming president. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. That passage just uh, really opened my eyes to a new aspect of Obama's presidency, not just in the US, but globally mm. what he meant. So that was really great to hear. I think now it is time to move on to the Q&A session. So we'll stop the um, recording.